And whenever I went in there, there's lay, some of them was laying there in, in the house that did. Blood running there which way. And it was a very horrible scene. And now, this is their loved ones. I mean, imagine the shock and horror that they had. Christmas is a time for joy, family, and togetherness. But it became a day of unspeakable horror for one North Carolina family in 1929. On December 25th, Charlie Lawson, a well-respected farmer in Germantown, shattered the holiday spirit forever when he brutally murdered his wife and six children. This then begs the question, what drove Charlie to commit such a monstrous act? Was it financial strain, madness, or something far more sinister? Stay tuned as we unravel the disturbing mystery behind the Lawson family murders, a tragedy that continues to haunt the small town of Germantown. Charles Davis Lawson, also known as Charlie Lawson, was born on May 10th in 1886 to Augustus and Nancy Lawson. The family lived in Lawsonville, where Lawson would later meet his wife, Franny Manring. Franny and Lawson got married in 1911 and went on to have eight children. Unfortunately, their third child, a son named William, passed away when he was only six years old in 1920 due to pneumonia. The surviving children were 17-year-old Marie, 16-year-old Arthur, 12-year-old Carrie, 7-year-old Maybell, 4-year-old James, 2-year-old Raymond, and 3-month-old Marilou. Seven years after he got married, Lawson moved his entire family to Germantown, a small town in North Carolina that to this day has a population of less than a thousand people wanting to be close to his family. Lawson's two younger brothers, Elijah and Marion, lived in Germantown with their families and had paved the way for tobacco farming. Lawson began working as a sharecropper until he managed to accumulate enough money to buy a small piece of land for his family on Brook Cove Road. This land was right next to his brothers, which gave the family the much-needed family time that they had desired before moving to Germantown. He would work at the fields in the morning, and by evenings, he would rebuild the tobacco barn along with Franny and their two older children, Marie and Arthur. One day while working inside the tobacco barn, Lawson had an accident with a piece of rotten timber and an axe. After his head injury, people around him began to notice changes in Lawson's personality. Although he was always known to have a temper, Lawson's anger outbursts not only got worse but also became more frequent. Perhaps this injury was what caused Lawson to kill his entire family a few years later. The Lawson family was known to be nice and normal in all the ways that mattered. Right before Christmas of 1929, the Lawsons had a particularly good tobacco harvest, which is why it was not odd when Lawson took his family shopping in Winston-Salem, another city in North Carolina, that was about 20 kilometers away from Germantown. Just two weeks away from Christmas, no one thought that it was out of the ordinary for the family to go shopping. Since it was the beginning of the Great Depression, it was not normal for working-class families to openly shop. This would only make sense if Lawson had premeditated the murders and was not thinking long-term. It was reported that Lawson had also told his family that the shopping was all part of a big Christmas surprise for the family. Lawson also took things one step further when he took the family to get a family portrait. Once again, this was uncommon and unheard of among working-class families as it was a bit expensive. The family portrait itself was a bit strange, with Marie standing next to Lawson, looking angry and upset at something. To her left, Lawson looks smug, while Franny looks worried. To this day, no one knows the circumstances surrounding the strange family portrait. Two weeks later, on December 25, 1929, Lawson and his oldest son, Arthur, went out rabbit hunting, a tradition that was followed every Christmas by the people in Germantown. This would also explain why no one was alarmed at the sound of shooting later that day. At the same time, his daughter, Marie, baked a two-tiered cake and carefully decorated it with icing and raisins. By the time the two of them reached their hunting spot, Arthur realized that they did not have ammunition. He then asked Lawson if he had any ammunition, but was told that there were no bullets left. After Lawson sends Arthur to fetch more bullets from the market, he begins his massacre. 
To this day, no one knows why Arthur was sent away. Why did Lawson decide to keep his oldest son alive? Was it merely a coincidence, or carefully premeditated because he thought that Arthur might have been able to stop him? Mary Bell and Carrie, who were on their way to their uncle's house to wish them a Merry Christmas, went through the tobacco barn, unaware that their father was hiding inside, waiting for them. As soon as the two of them passed by the barn, Lawson shot them with a 12-gauge shotgun. Although he managed to kill both of the girls, he waited for a bit before going back to them and bludgeoning them to make sure that they were really dead. He then went towards the house where 37-year-old Franny was sitting on the front porch steps, cutting potatoes. Lawson shot her in the chest once, killing her instantly. Hearing the commotion outside, Marie, who was still inside the house, started screaming and managed to tell her younger brothers, James and Raymond, to hide. However, Lawson shot Marie in the chest as well and killed her. He then went on to find the two younger boys and shot them dead as well. Things went from bad to worse when Lawson went up to the bedroom where three-month-old Marilou lay in her crib. He bludgeoned her to death with the shotgun. It was reported that she died from a fractured skull. Since hunting was common during Christmas, no one arrived at the crime scene right away, giving Lawson a chance to escape along with the family's dogs. He headed into the woods outside of the house and circled around a dogwood tree. Until hours later, he finally turned the gun on himself and took his own life. Arthur, who was still buying ammunition, heard about the murders and rushed home only to discover a complete bloodbath. It was Lawson's younger brother Elijah and his two sons who discovered the bodies. Lawson had laid all of the bodies in front of the farmhouse with their arms crossed over their chest and rocks underneath their heads acting as pillows. The bodies seemed to be casket ready since everyone was wearing the new clothes that Lawson had bought them just two weeks earlier. Killed them all in the house there but uh, two girls and then he shot them right there at the barn and drug them into the barn and put rocks under their heads. Now, a man's bound to be crazy to do things like that, you know. That, I don't believe I could do nothing like that with my family, because you, uh, unless you was crazy or something bad wrong. Since Germantown was a small town, it was not long until the entire community showed up at the Lawson household. While the community was still grappling with the harrowing crime scene in front of them, a loud gunshot was heard from the woodland nearby. A police officer, along with Arthur, rushed into the woods, only to find that Lawson had shot himself. His body was surrounded by letters addressed to his parents. However, the letters failed to identify the motive of his crimes. There were also two tobacco auction receipts found in Lawson's pocket with unfinished notes on them. One of the receipts said trouble can cause, and the other one said nobody to blame. He shot himself over in the woods. He carried him a stick and turned the gun right towards the man just heart and shot himself right in the heart. It was a horror story. I mean, it, it was a national story. It made the front page of the New York Times, so it was more than just a local story. It reportedly snowed anywhere from six to eight inches that day, which is why it was easy to discern that Lawson had walked around the dogwood tree as there was a patch of snow missing from the area, likely contemplating his next move. The Lawson family home was located on top of the hill, which made it harder to get the bodies down bedsheets were borrowed from the Lawson household to create makeshift sleds. The bodies were then dragged down the hill and taken to Walnut Cove Funeral House. However, since the town had a very small population, it was not surprising that the funeral home was not equipped to handle eight bodies at once. The bodies were then transported to Madison Newton's funeral parlor on Murphy Street. The autopsies for all eight bodies were conducted by Dr. C.J. Hasselbeck, who was the Stokes County coroner. He, along with Dr. Spotswood Taylor, a pathologist who worked at Johns Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore, spent the entire night working together. Dr. Taylor, who was home for the Christmas holidays, decided to remove Lawson's brain from his head for further examination and placed it in a jar of preserved formaldehyde, a medical preservative. His reasoning for this was to examine the brain closely to see if any abnormalities would provide some insight into why Lawson had decided to go on a rampage. They discovered that although his brain was smaller than usual and the center part of it was underdeveloped, there were no abnormalities that stood out, or at least anything that would provide an explanation for his behavior. What makes things worse is that the entire Lawson family was buried together, 
so the victims were buried right next to their murderer. There were seven graves because three-month-old Marilou was buried in her mother's arms. The headstone inscription said, Not now, but in the coming years. It will be in a better land. We'll read the meaning of our tears, and then sometime we'll understand. The news of the murders had taken the community by surprise, and it attracted tons of attention, as even the New York Times published a front-page article with a headline reading, Stokes Farmer Kills Wife and six children. People from all over the country drove up to attend the funeral. Over 5,000 people were in attendance, and the cars were lined as far as four kilometers down the block. Just ten days after the funeral, Lawson's brother Marion opened the house to the public as a tourist attraction. Right away, he built a fence around the house. Although Marion experienced some pushback as people thought that it was morbid of him to cash off his family's murder, However, he justified it by saying that Arthur needed money to pay the mortgage on the house. True to his word, Marion charged 25 cents per person to walk through the bloodied murder scene. Nothing in the crime scene had been changed or moved around, including Marilou's bloody crib. People took a strange fascination towards the crime scene and even decided to take souvenirs. The house got 500 visitors a day due to the fact that Marion had put up ads in the newspaper that drew even more attention towards the Lawson family house. It was speculated that a man named John Dillinger, a well-known mobster who had escaped prison, made a stop at the house as well. He even left a note for the police to find, mocking them for their incompetence. As the house continued to attract visitors, someone decided to bring in a jar to collect Franny's blood from the front porch stairs. Bricks from the fireplace where Marie had died were also taken as souvenirs. The dogwood tree's bark that Lawson had died in front of had been stripped bare since people collected the bark as memorabilia. The last straw was people picking off the raisins from the cake Marie had baked on Christmas morning for her family. Marion then encased the cake in a glass container to stop people from taking pieces from the cake. The infamous cake remained on display for a long time. There are several conflicting reports that state that Marion buried the cake in front of the house when it was demolished, while others claim that Arthur went back to the house and took the cake with him. However, there is not enough evidence to prove that this happened. Some speculated that the cake that was displayed was replaced along with the raisins on it. By the end of January 1930, the family's belongings were auctioned off. From their clothes to the bloody crib and the murder weapon, everything was sold off. In fact, the murder weapons were sold for a large sum of money. After the auction, Marion set up a tent and sold off the last of the memorabilia of the Lawson family. Arthur chose to not publicly comment on anything regarding his family's murder. However, in an unfortunate turn of events in 1945, a 31-year-old Arthur was involved in a freak accident and passed away, leaving behind a wife and four children. The Lawson family house as well as the tobacco barn were demolished. Years later, people reported seeing ghosts of children running around the farmland, while others reported seeing Lawson's ghost around the dogwood tree. Although there is no proof of whether this is true, some claim that in autumn, the leaves fall everywhere except for around the circular area where Lawson had paced before turning the gun on himself. The same thing was reported when it started snowing everywhere else except for the circular area. It seems that everyone decided to profit from the family's tragedy as Madison Newton's funeral parlor, which had changed its name to Madison Dry Goods in downtown Madison, decided to open up the upstairs mortuary for the public. The owners, Richard and Kathy Miller, decided to restore the original mortuary and even put up signed pictures of the Lawson family. The tragedy remained popular and had books, poems, and even songs written about it. One popular song called The Murder of the Lawson Family by Carolina Buddies gained traction and sold more than 8,000 units, which was a huge number as the Great Depression was beginning to set in. Two notable books were published, one in 1990 by a father and daughter duo, Trudy J. Smith and M. Bruce Jones, called White Christmas, Bloody Christmas and the other book was published in 2006 called The Meaning of Our Tears by Trudy J. Smith.
Several theories flew around with people trying to speculate about Lawson's motive. However, only a few seemed plausible. One theory claimed that Lawson had witnessed an organized crime incident. This is why he, along with the rest of his family, was killed, but made to seem like a murder-suicide case. Another theory hypothesized that Lawson had developed a medical condition due to his incident with the axe. However, this theory was quickly debunked because Johns Hopkins Medical Center did not find any abnormalities in his brain that would explain his erratic behavior. It is not far-fetched to think that autopsies in that day and age were not as thorough as they are today, hence something could have been missed. Lawson's brain cannot be examined again due to the fact that it is very old and was not as well preserved as one would hope. One theory, which is one that is widely believed since there is some evidence to back this up, is that Marie was sexually assaulted by her father and had gotten pregnant as a result. This theory did not come out until 1990 when the book White Christmas, Bloody Christmas was published. The author interviewed a relative of the Lawson family named Stella Lawson, who was the daughter of Jetty Lawson. Jetty was Charlie Lawson's sister, but had died in 1928. Stella reported that she had heard some of the older women in her family talking about the fact that Franny had been worried about an incestuous relationship between her husband and daughter Marie. Since Jetty passed away a year before the murders, there was no way to confirm or deny these rumors. In the book The Meaning of Our Tears, Trudy J. Smith interviewed Ella May, a good friend of Marie Lawson. Ella reported that Marie had told her friends during a sleepover that she was pregnant with her father's child and that her mother knew about it as well. Another testimony came from Sam Hill, a close friend and neighbor of the Lawson family, who claimed that the Lawsons were going through some serious troubles and that fights between Franny and Lawson had become more frequent. He also revealed that Lawson had threatened Marie and told her that if she exposed their relationship, there would be some killing done. Although the autopsies did not report any pregnancies, there can be several explanations for it, including the fact that the coroner could have hidden some of his findings to protect the family from more shame. Another explanation could be that the standard autopsy procedure at the time did not involve checking for potential pregnancies. There is no sure-shot way of knowing whether Marie was pregnant, because even if she was, it was probably too early in the pregnancy to tell anything. This theory could also not be pursued further, because by the time DNA sampling became common, Marie's body was far too old and decomposed to be able to tell anything. Since the coffins used were of lower quality as well, none of the bodies were preserved well enough for them to exhume them. This also brings us to the last theory, that Lawson found himself so deep in his financial problems that he decided to take out his entire family so that they could be together after death. After all, how can you explain why someone would kill a three-month-old child? This is also plausible since the Great Depression had been setting in, and it affected working-class families, such as the Lawsons the most. What do you think drove Charlie Lawson to murder his entire family? What theory seems the most likely motive? Do you think Marie Lawson knew something sinister was about to happen? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you want more videos like this, please be sure to like the video, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on more true crime videos. Thank you for watching.